Welcome to this new module on Computable General Equilibrium Modeling, Climate Change, and Carbon Pricing. In this module, you will learn how to integrate the essential elements in the modeling of the fight against climate change, in particular with regards to carbon pricing. The issue of climate change is perhaps the main challenge facing humanity in the 21st century. Between 1880 and 2012, the global average temperature increased by 0.85 degrees Celsius. Due to the warming of the oceans, the rise in sea levels is an unequivocal phenomenon. The surface of the earth where water is in a solid state, whether it is ice or snow, is constantly shrinking. The extent of the Arctic sea ice has shrunk by about 4% per decade over the past 40 years. Over the period 1901 to 2010, the sea level rose by 19 centimeters on average. The average global temperature on Earth is directly related to the concentration of greenhouse gases, GHGs, in the atmosphere. Given current concentrations and ongoing greenhouse gas emissions, the world's oceans will warm and the ice will continue to melt. The average sea level rise is expected to be 24 to 30 centimeters by 2065 and 40 to 63 centimeters by 2100 compared to 2005. Most aspects of climate change will persist for several centuries, even if emissions are stopped. The anthropogenic contribution to the greenhouse effect since 1750 comes mainly from four gases. Three quarters of the contribution comes from carbon dioxide, 11% of which is attributable to deforestation since plants capture CO2. Most carbon dioxide emissions come from the combustion of petroleum products. This is because petroleum is made up of carbon and as it burns, this carbon combines with oxygen to form CO2. Methane persists in the atmosphere for less than 10 years but its global warming potential is 28 times greater than carbon dioxide. The methane emitted by humans comes mainly from the combustion of natural gas, which is methane buried in the ground. Nitrous oxide has a global warming potential 310 times greater than carbon dioxide, in addition to contributing to the destruction of the ozone layer. It comes mainly from the use of fertilizers in agriculture, Finally, halocarbons are gases produced by humans. The warming potential varies depending on the gas. They also contribute to the destruction of the ozone layer. GHG emissions are measured by comparing their global warming potential to that of carbon dioxide. For example, one ton of methane counts as 28 tons of carbon dioxide because its global warming potential is 28 times higher. Emissions are, therefore, measured in tons of CO2 equivalent. In the following graph, we see that global GHG emissions increased from 27 to 49 billion tons of CO2 equivalent between 1970 and 2010, and that the rate of growth in emissions has accelerated since the year 2000. Dioxide emissions of carbon have doubled during this period and are the main cause of this increase. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is the United Nations organization responsible for scientifically documenting the phenomenon of climate change. Its fifth assessment report, published in 2013, serves as a cornerstone in the fight against climate change. A sixth edition is scheduled for 2022. In the fifth report, the IPCC sets a clear and precise goal to limit the increase in global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. To achieve this, and given the constant increase in GHG emissions since the Industrial Revolution, the IPCC proposes to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 through a 45% reduction in emissions between 2010 and 2030. The goal of carbon neutrality means that all human-made GHG emissions would be cancelled, either by planting trees and other plants, or by capture and storage technologies. 
In response to the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report, 175 countries signed the Paris Agreement on April 22, 2016. As of March 31, 2021, 191 countries are signatories to the agreement, which covers almost all the GHG emissions on Earth. The central objective of the Paris Agreement is to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by keeping the global temperature increase well below 2 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. The signatory states also undertake to continue efforts to limit this increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The Paris Agreement is not binding, but it requires each country to establish a target for capping and reducing GHG emissions. In addition, the text stipulates that developed countries must provide financial resources to help developing countries. It is thus the most far-reaching climate agreement to date, involving almost every country in the world and providing for global collaboration to combat climate change. There are two main families of environmental policies. Binding policies and control measures, for example, regulations, and market-oriented policies such as taxes and subsidies. Binding policies and control measures have the advantage of ensuring efficiency in terms of results since they oblige economic agents to comply with the law or the standard that is set. It is also a sure way to prevent the irreversible effects of the most dangerous pollutants, sometimes requiring rules that can go as far as a total ban on emissions. In addition, in certain sectors for which GHG emissions are diffuse and difficult to measure correctly, such as agriculture, this type of measure is often easier to put in place for the public authorities. However, regulation also has several drawbacks. Applying an environmental law requires the establishment of heavy and costly control systems for public actors. It also presents economic inefficiency because for some agents, compliance with regulations involves a higher cost than for others. For example, it is very difficult for some industries to reduce their GHG emissions. The production of aluminum or cement, for example, causes a chemical reaction that releases a large amount of carbon dioxide. Asking these industries to stop emitting GHGs or to meet a standard that is too restrictive could mean preventing them from existing. In addition, regulations do not encourage economic agents to make more effort in terms of pollution control, that is, to go beyond the required standard, because they find no economic interest in it. Thus, binding policies may be necessary in specific cases, but will not allow signatories to the Paris Agreement to meet their targets. To achieve their targets, signatory countries must emphasize market-oriented policies, that is, policies that use economic mechanisms, such as prices, to achieve the desired effect. First, it is possible to put into place targeted policies, such as taxes on fuel-intensive vehicles or on fuels, subsidies for public transport, or the development of new ecological technologies, etc. In addition, many environmental standards now have credit trading systems that allow agents who cannot meet regulatory requirements to buy credits for those who do better than the standard. Thus, the border between the two types of environmental policies is sometimes blurred. The main advantage of market-oriented policies is that they allow the internalization of externalities. Indeed, the subsidies will have the effect of reducing the price and increasing the quantity traded of products generating positive externalities while taxes will increase the price and decrease the quantity traded of products with negative externalities. Moreover, these fiscal instruments are generally well mastered by governments, which means that these measures can be put into place quickly and correctly. However, the scope of these measures is often limited. They often target specific industries or products, and in the case of GHG emissions, it would be difficult to put in place a specific tax for each source of emissions. In addition, they risk getting the wrong target because it is not GHGs that are directly taxed. For example, a public transit subsidy can have the beneficial effect of encouraging many people to stop using their cars, 
However, by freeing up road space and making it easier to travel, it also promotes urban sprawl, which could reduce and even negate the initial benefit. The most widely recognized way for economists to reduce GHG emissions is to directly put a price on those emissions, which is commonly referred to as carbon pricing. Pricing can be done in two ways, either by taxing GHG emissions or by setting up a system of permits and the trading of GHG emissions rights. The latter option consists of requiring economic agents to hold a permit for each tonne of CO2 equivalent they emit. Agents can buy these permits from the government, which usually distributes them at auction. Agents can then trade these permits in secondary markets known as a carbon exchange. This will be discussed later in this course, but the tax and the cap can theoretically give the same results. The only fundamental difference is that in the case of the tax, the government controls the price and lets the emissions adjust, whereas in the case of the cap, the government controls the emissions and lets the price adjust. Like targeted taxes and subsidies, carbon pricing helps internalize negative externalities related to GHG emissions. However, its action is more direct and its impact is much wider. It therefore makes it possible to correct a major market failure. However, some sectors may escape pricing if accounting for their individual emissions is too complex. For example, methane emissions from enteric fermentation in farm animals, mainly bovids, are very difficult to measure at the scale of an agricultural producer. The level of emissions depends on the number of animals, which can be easily known but also on the type of animal feed, the amount of food eaten, and even the presence of certain bacteria. The agricultural sector is therefore generally exempt from carbon pricing. Another disadvantage of carbon pricing is its varying social acceptability. Its implementation naturally implies a rise in the price of energy as well as rising costs for several industries, which can make it highly unpopular. It is contested in several countries and when passed, it is often in a watered-down form, leading environmentalists to say that carbon pricing does not work. Thus, even if it represents, theoretically, the best weapon to fight against climate change, the political reality is more complex. However, carbon pricing is still the main tool in the fight against climate change. Computable general equilibrium models are ideal for properly analyzing this tool because they take into account changes in the behaviors of agents as a result of changes in relative prices, and they describe all sectors of an economy. To build a computable general equilibrium model well suited to this problem, it is necessary to prepare it well. We must think carefully about the different aggregation choices and the shape of the production and consumption functions. It is also essential to understand the pricing system that you want to model. Any pricing system has its peculiarities and the details can significantly influence the assumptions and results of the model. Ideally, the model should be dynamic. Indeed, the fight against climate change is aiming for carbon neutrality in 2050 and several countries have ambitious targets for 2030. It is therefore essential to analyze the temporal aspect of this issue. In addition, pricing is often introduced gradually, with prices increasing each year. The first part of this course, therefore, consists of presenting the steps necessary for the construction of a computable general equilibrium model suitable for the analysis of carbon pricing. First of all, it is important to clearly define a few concepts and to understand where GHG emissions come from. The electricity and heat generation sector is the main source of GHG emissions in the world and accounts for 25% of total emissions. To the right of the graph, we notice that this energy is mainly used by the residential, commercial and institutional building sector with 12% and by industry with 11%. By adding the other energy sectors to this, we can see that energy production accounts for nearly 35% of GHG emissions in the world. 
The second source, with 24% of GHG emissions, is the AFOLU sector, which represents agriculture, forestry, and other land uses. The use of fertilizers, enteric fermentation of farm animals, and forest and peatland fires are among the main elements that make up this sector. Next is the industrial sector, which emits 21% of GHG emissions. Their emissions can be divided into two main types, fossil fuel combustion and industrial processes. Finally, transport and construction generate 14% and 6% of GHG emissions respectively. All of these sectors need to be factored into models that look at carbon pricing. Particular attention will therefore be paid to the modeling of each of them. The previous graph presented the sectoral distribution of global GHG emissions, but obviously each country has its own particularities that must be considered in the modeling. Logically, even greater care will be taken in modeling the sectors that emit the most GHGs. For example, the following graph distinguishes emissions according to the income of the country from which they originate. It separates countries into four categories, ranging from low to high income. The bunker category on the left represents emissions that are not associated with a particular country. These are mainly emissions from international air and marine transportation. It can be seen that the emissions of low-income countries come overwhelmingly from the agriculture, forestry, and other land uses sector, the AFOLU sector. As we will repeat a few times during this presentation, emissions from this sector often escape carbon pricing. However, the more a country's income grows, the more energy and industry sectors emerge as the largest emitters. The transport sector is also becoming much more important for high-income countries, and in general, we also notice that the more that income increases, the more that emissions increase. The first step in preparing the model is to choose the desired level of detail for the products and industries. This level of detail obviously depends on the availability of data, but also on the structure and particularities of the economy to be modeled. It is probably not necessary to separate all of the fossil fuels listed here. For example, it is possible to have a very complete model without having to disaggregate all the refined petroleum products. However, we must be aware that by grouping these products together, we implicitly assume that they are perfectly substitutable, both in production and consumption. Other products require special attention, such as electricity and other energy products that can be substituted for fossil fuels. The various transport services of air, sea, rail, and road, as well as public transportation, can also be detailed in order to take into account their specificities. Finally, products whose production emits GHGs, such as cement, several metals, and various chemicals, can be distinguished from the rest of manufacturing production. This last distinction will be important. Indeed, GHG emissions from the manufacturing sector can be distinguished into two main categories. Combustion emissions, which arise from the use of fuels for energy purposes, and process emissions, which come from a chemical reaction that releases GHGs during the production of a specific product. For example, to produce cement and lime, you have to calcine it, which means to reduce the components, which are 80% limestone, by heating them in a kiln to form clinker. On heating, the calcium carbonate that forms limestone is broken down into lime and carbon dioxide, which is the main greenhouse gas on Earth. Since it is essential for the production of cement and lime, this CO2 emission is therefore difficult to avoid. This is why, in general, it is more expensive to reduce process emissions than combustion emissions. In addition to distinguishing between types of emissions, it is ideal to disaggregate industries so as to separate the most emitting ones. Indeed, each industry has its peculiarities. If industries are too aggregated, 
the model not fully account for the consequences of an increase in the output of one manufacturing product relative to another. For example, each product requires a different energy intake. Each industry has a different capacity to substitute energy products between them. In summary, just as with energy products, the level of retail industry in the manufacturing sector needs to be quite high. After having identified the products and industries to be separated, it is then necessary to choose the production function which will make it possible to properly represent the choices facing companies. The production functions usually used for models that look at carbon pricing are the KLE and the KEL functions. These functions, which are said to be nested, make it possible to highlight the role of energy in production by integrating energy into the added value of companies. The possible substitution between capital investments and energy, which reflects energy efficient gains, is therefore taken into account better. The difference between functions KLE and KEL is the level of substitution between energy, capital, and labor. Starting at the bottom of the diagram, we see that the KEL function first allows a substitution between capital and energy. Then, this capital energy composite, or KE, is substituted for labor. Finally, the capital energy labor value added, or KEL, is combined with intermediate consumption, generally in fixed shares. For the KLE function, it is rather labor and capital that are substituted directly, as in the Cobb-Douglas production functions that we usually encounter in our other economics courses. This capital labor composite, or KL, is substituted for energy to form an added value, KLE. The choice of which function to use is at the discretion of the modelers but it seems that the KEL form makes it possible to better represent the gains to be invested in energy efficiency. In addition, it is essential to pair these functional forms with functions that allow the degree of substitution to be changed depending on the industry, that is, functions with constant elasticity of substitution, or CES. By choosing a gamma elasticity of substitution, whose value can be between zero and infinity, it is possible to represent both perfect complementarity, therefore a Leontief function, and perfect substitutability, so a linear function. For an elasticity of substitution equal to one, we find the good old Cobb-Douglas function. By combining the CES functions with a KEL form, it will thus be possible to model with flexibility and precision the interaction between energy, capital, and other factors of production. Finally, it will be important to allow substitution between the different energy products, again using one or more CES functions. In more detail, here is what an ideal production function might look like. Obviously, the exact modeling choices will depend on the research question, but also on the availability of data. A similar model could very well be adequate if it allows for the isolation of essential elements related to the research question. First, starting at the top of the diagram, we see that production directly generates process emissions. Thus, to reduce process emissions, it is necessary to reduce production, which can be economically costly. Production is made up of intermediate and value-added consumption. These two elements are brought together by a Leontief function, therefore in fixed parts. Intermediate consumption is made up of all non-energy products, which includes transport services and other products that induce GHG emissions. Obviously, the productions of these products will come from another industry, which itself will have a production function similar to this one, but with different parameters. In terms of added value, the KEL shape was chosen. This means that labor and the capital energy composite product are linked by a CES function. Depending on the availability of data, we can then divide capital into two categories, fixed assets and rolling stock. 
because the energy products that correspond to each of the categories differ. If this categorization is not possible, then it will be important to treat fossil fuels in two different groups. For example, a transport-related product such as gasoline cannot be substituted for a capital-related product like coal or petroleum coke. After having linked energy and capital by a CES function, it is finally necessary to bring together the energy products in another CES function. It will then be possible for the model to substitute fossil fuels with other energy sources, such as electricity, hydrogen, forest biomass, etc. The consumption of these products will result in GHG emissions, but as we can see, companies will be able to reduce these emissions by reducing their consumption without necessarily reducing their production. The cost of reducing combustion emissions should therefore be lower than the cost of reducing process emissions. The diagram on the previous slide can serve as a basic functional form for the model, but should be adapted according to the type of industry. Thus, the energy production and distribution sectors will have to be treated differently from other industries. On the energy production side, a large part of their fossil fuel consumption is used as a feedstock for energy production, which often makes substitution impossible or very difficult. This finding implies that fossil fuel processing activities, such as crude oil refining, generate mostly process emissions because they do not use fossil fuels for energy purposes. This distinction will be important because the fuel used as a raw material should not be considered as an energy product in the production function. In contrast, industries that convert fuels into refined products can also use fossil fuels as an energy source. For example, refineries can use natural gas to heat crude oil. In this case, the possibilities of substitution are small, but possible. The use of these fuels therefore generates combustion emissions. On the fuel distribution side, the industries that carry out this activity obviously consume a significant amount of fuel, but as in the case of transformation, not for energy purposes. In fact, in these activities, the emissions are relatively low since the fuel is not heated or burned. However, they can be subject to leaks, which generate fugitive emissions. These can be related to process emissions because they are proportional to the amount produced. The production function of a refinery could therefore correspond to this pattern. We see that it is almost identical to that presented above, except that crude oil has been removed from energy products. This change takes into account the peculiarity of this industry and prevents an unlikely substitution between crude oil and electricity, for example. In this form, emissions from the combustion or heating of crude oil can end up in process emissions. Alternatively, they could also be directly linked to the consumption of crude oil, which amounts to the same thing since crude oil constitutes here a fixed part of production. Another industry that needs to be modeled differently is power generation, as this activity can take different forms and use products with very different properties. The simple modeling of this industry is to have a single electricity production sector for which the consumption of the different inputs is represented by a CES function. In this way, the industry produces a main product, electricity, using a variety of products that can substitute for each other. However, this modeling can be problematic if the production of electricity involves both the use of non-renewable resources and renewable resources. For example, a wind power plant which does not consume energy products could not replace a natural gas plant since the substitution only takes place between energy products. To avoid this problem, it is preferable to model an industry by type of power plant. It is then the production of each of these industries which will be aggregated and which will constitute the total electricity supply. For example, a gas-fired power plant would have a production function identical to that of an oil refinery, with two differences. 
First, it is natural gas that would be removed from energy products and placed for intermediate consumption, rather than crude oil for the refinery. Second, the electricity produced by this industry would be combined with the output of other types of power plants. This could include thermal power plants, which use petroleum products, but also wind or hydroelectric plants, which would use fewer energy products. The output of all these industries could be combined by a linear function, therefore assuming perfect substitutability, or by a constant elasticity of transformation function, or CET, which is the equivalent of a CES function, but for supply. A linear function would be adequate for an economy whose electricity market is characterized by fierce competition between different types of power plants. A CET function might be preferable if the model has to take into account network issues. Indeed, it can be difficult to substitute between electricity from different sources if distribution is constrained, especially by the lack of distribution network infrastructure. For example, an economy might have thermal power plants and wind power plants in its territory, but both supply energy and electricity to a very specific territory. In this precise case, the substitution between the two types of electricity would be difficult and would be better represented by a CET function than by a linear function. The AFOLU sector brings together other industries with potentially significant GHG emissions. These are the agricultural and forestry sectors, which as we saw earlier, can even account for the largest part of GHG emissions in developing countries. Emissions from these sectors are often more difficult to account for and control and can generally be related to process emissions, that is, emissions that change at the same rate as production. Emissions from the agricultural sector come from three main sources. Enteric fermentation, that is the digestion of animals, which emits methane. Manure, which emits methane and nitrous oxide. The use of fertilizers and soil management in general, which emits nitrous oxide and other greenhouse gases. There are therefore two distinct activities, the GHG emissions of which would be ideally treated separately animal husbandry, which emits methane and nitrous oxide, as well as crops of all kinds which require fertilizers that emit nitrous oxide. In addition, these sectors can also help reduce GHG emissions. The productions of biofuels, often from corn or forest residues, can replace fossil fuel. Thus, a policy of combating climate change could lead to an increase in demand for the production of these industries. Bottom line, while modeling these sectors within a carbon pricing framework is not straightforward, the bare minimum is to properly represent their combustion emissions. Another sector whose modeling can be complex is that of waste management. Emissions from this activity depend on the stock of waste, which itself depends on past economic activity. One way to represent it is to link it to current economic activity or to treat it as a stock. Some models specializing in this type of question can be used to give an exogenous trend, which then can be integrated into the computable general equilibrium model. The transport sector can be a major emitter of GHGs, particularly in richer countries. We can separate this sector into two main categories. The first is private transport, which is consumed as much by households as by industries and which results in the direct use of vehicles and fuels. Household transport can be modeled in the manner of industries, that is to say, by directly linking transport capital to fuel consumption. The more complex models will distinguish between different types of vehicles depending on their size and the type of energy consumed. Over the next few years, the electrification of transportation will become an increasingly important issue and it will be necessary to represent this reality well in computable general equilibrium models. The second category is public transportation, which breaks down into different types of transport services. Households and industries can switch between these transport services through one or more CES functions.
In turn, these transport services will be produced by industries that will consume energy products, including fossil fuels. The production function of these industries will be similar to that described above. Much like transportation, the construction sector can be divided into two categories. On the one hand, there are households and businesses that own buildings that directly consume energy for heating, lighting, and air conditioning, etc. In this case, energy consumption is ideally linked to a building capital stock, for which it is possible to invest in energy efficiency and to substitute between different energy products. The building stock can be distinguished according to the type of building, single-family homes having higher energy requirements than a housing unit inside an apartment building. On the other hand, households and businesses can also rent a building from the real estate services industry, which itself will have a consumption of energy products defined by one or more CES functions. In short, when the production function of industries is well constructed, energy consumption linked to transport and buildings should adequately reflect the behavior of firms in the face of changes in the relative prices of energy products. Once the structure of the model has been decided, the next step is to ensure the availability of data. In addition to verifying that the level of detail of the usual economic data is sufficient and consistent with the aggregation choices, it is necessary to be able to rely on quality data on GHG emissions. Accounting for these emissions is a relatively young science and the degree of precision and detail varies across jurisdictions. Most GHG emissions inventories use the United Nations System of Economic and Environmental Accounts, which helps ensure standardization of measurements around the world. The Paris Agreement requires each signatory to produce an annual GHG emissions inventory report. However, even developed countries with significant resources at their disposal regularly review their past GHG emissions inventories. It is not uncommon for a simple change in assumption about the warming potential of a gas, for example, to cause historical inventories to vary by more than 1%. Knowing this, one should be aware that the model base year GHG emissions could change over time which will involve recalibrating certain parameters each time. Ideally, the GHG emissions inventory available to you would show emissions by sector, by fuel type, and even by gas type. In reality, such precise data is rather difficult to find. More likely, you will have the total GHG emissions by sector and the total emissions by fuel and then you will need to use the fuel consumptions of each of the sectors to estimate emissions by sector and by fuel. Furthermore, as mentioned earlier, the unit of measurement used for GHG emissions is a ton of CO2 equivalent. All emissions are therefore calculated based on their global warming potential relative to carbon dioxide. National GHG emission inventories are usually broken down by IPCC sectors. The level of detail can be quite high, as shown in this example of an inventory produced by Environment and Climate Change Canada. However, the IPCC sectors do not necessarily correspond to the sectors described in the supply and use tables. Some assumptions and a detailed understanding of these inventories will be necessary in order to distribute the GHG emissions adequately in the social accounting matrix. Source, National Inventory Report, 1990 to 2018, Greenhouse Gas Sources and Sinks in Canada. Here's another example of data that can be useful. Statistic Canada's physical flow accounts estimates Canada's GHG emissions from each industry on the same basis as the supply and use tables Unfortunately, this data is not broken down by process or combustion emissions and does not offer any product disaggregation, which limits how you can use it. It is possible to combine this data with another database, which would be disaggregated on the basis of products. You could then estimate the emissions by product for each of the industries, assuming that the difference between the total emissions 
and the sum of the emissions by product corresponds to the process emissions. This data can also simply be used to verify that the other data, which you may have, is coherent with this one. Once the data is collected, processed, and integrated into the social accounting matrix, it is now possible to calibrate GHG emission coefficients, which correspond to the phi parameters, by dividing the GHG emissions by the corresponding variable. GHG emissions are divided into three categories. GESY represents those which come from the processes and which are directly related to production Y of the IND industry. GESX represents those arising from the use of fossil fuels by industries and which are directly related to the consumption X of the product PROD by industry IND. Finally, GESC represents those arising from the use of fossil fuels by households which is directly linked to the consumption C of the product PROD by households. Regarding the Phi X parameter, we could assume that it is the same for each industry, since it is above all the nature of the product used that influences GHG emissions. For example, the combustion of a cubic meter of natural gas is expected to generate emissions of around 2 kilograms of CO2 equivalent regardless of the industry responsible. However, this assumption would be incorrect for several other products depending on the level of disaggregation. For example, if all refined petroleum products are aggregated into a single category, the coefficient should vary depending on whether the industry primarily consumes gasoline or petroleum coke, two products with GHG emissions that differ greatly. Because of the aggregation of products, it is therefore often preferable to calibrate different coefficients for each pairing of product and industry. Part 1 described all the steps required to produce a model that considers GHG emissions. Now is the time to integrate the various elements that will make it suitable for answering questions on carbon pricing. As explained earlier, Pricing GHG emissions can be done in two ways, either by taxing emissions or by setting up a system of permits and emissions trading. The fundamental difference between these two systems is that the price is exogenous and that the emissions are endogenous in the case of the tax, while it is the reverse in the case of the cap. Cap systems can also cover multiple jurisdictions implying that the market is in equilibrium for all jurisdictions involved, but not necessarily for the one targeted by the model. For example, modeling the pricing of a European country will require making an assumption about the country's influence in the European carbon market. Is this a small country, like Luxembourg, for which one can assume price-taking behavior? This situation is easier to model since it allows the market price to be exogenous, making the cap identical to the tax. But perhaps it is rather a more important country, like Germany, for which it will be necessary to suppose an interaction between its emissions and the market equilibrium. In this case, it will at least be necessary to introduce an external demand function for the emission rights. In this course, we will focus on systems involving only one country in order to simplify the demonstration a bit. Finally, there are also hybrid systems that incorporate some elements of both systems, but we will stick with the tax and cap for the purpose of this course, again to simplify the demonstration. The following graph shows how the two systems compare. On the left, the carbon tax imposes a price on GHG emissions. We can therefore consider that in the GHG emissions market, the supply is perfectly elastic, the price being equal to the level of the tax, while the demand for GHG emissions has the usual form of a function with a negative slope. Thus, the more the tax increases, the more GHG emissions decrease. On the right, the cap-and-trade system places a cap on GHG 
emissions. We can therefore consider that in the GHG emissions market, the supply is perfectly inelastic, the emissions not being able to exceed the level established by the cap. In this situation, the more the cap decreases, the more the price of the emissions increases. In theory, therefore, the two systems can achieve exactly the same result, although in practice important differences exist with regard to the implementation and administration of the system. According to the World Bank, 22% of emissions were covered by a carbon pricing system in 2020. The jurisdictions colored green are those that have implemented or are in the process of implementing a cap trade system, while those colored blue have instead implemented or are in the process of implementing a tax. However, just because a country has adopted a pricing system does not mean that the system covers all emissions. In addition, the level of the tax or the cap are important. A tax that is too low will have little or no impact on reducing GHG emissions, even if a large part of the emissions is covered. In this model, we can represent precisely these differences in coverage using the tau parameter which will associate a coverage rate with each type of GHG emissions. For example, for process emissions, most pricing systems only cover companies that are considered to be significant GHG emitters. A non-negligible part of process emissions and fugitive emissions are therefore not subject to pricing. For fuel-related emissions, air and marine transport is sometimes excluded from the pricing since it is difficult to separate the emissions that have occurred in international territory. The information on the tau parameters is inferred with the rules of the modeling pricing system. It will be equal to zero in the absence of coverage and to one if coverage is complete. Information on the emissions covered can be used to calculate this parameter with more precision, if necessary. Once the tau parameter has been calibrated, the GHG bar variable will represent the portion of GHG emissions that is covered by the pricing. This pricing of GHG emissions will be reflected in the price of fossil fuels. It is usually the fuel distributors who must comply with the pricing. These will then pass, in whole or in part, the price of carbon to the buyer, depending on the elasticities of supply and demand for the product. In the model, this phenomenon will be represented as follows. On the left side, the amount paid for each of the products is described by multiplying the final price, P hat, and consumption, C. This amount must be equal, on the right side, to the multiplication of the price received by the distributor, P, and consumption, C, plus the cost of GHG emissions. The cost of GHGs is written as the multiplication of the price of emissions, be it the tax or the price of emissions rights, and the quantity of GHGs covered by the pricing that comes from this product. From equations 3 and 6 described above, we can rewrite GHG bar as being equal to the coverage rate tau multiplied by the emission coefficient phi and the consumption of product C. The next step is to divide by the consumption on both sides of the equation. We finally obtain the following result. The price paid by consumers, P hat, is equal to the price received by distributors P plus the price of GHGs multiplied by the coverage ratio and the emission coefficient. The same holds true for the consumption of fossil fuels by industries. This result does not mean that the pricing will be fully borne by the buyer, but rather that the difference between the price paid by the buyer and that received by the distributor is equal to the price of the GHG emissions emitted by the consumption of this product. This will actually result in a higher price for consumers and a lower price received by distributors. Indeed, since the consumption of fossil fuels by households and industries is described by a CES function, they will react to the higher price by replacing the targeted products with other less polluting energy products. In doing so, the demand for products that emit GHGs will decrease.
which will also reduce the price received by the distributor. The CES function therefore plays a very important role in pricing modeling, as it allows households and businesses to reduce their consumption of fossil fuels while minimizing the negative consequences on their utility or profits. On the process side, reducing emissions is more difficult. The cost of GHGs from process emissions is factored into the industry's budget function. The total income on the left side is equal on the right side to the added value, the sum of international consumption, and the cost of process emissions covered by the pricing GHG bar. From equations 1 and 4, these emissions can be rewritten as the multiplication of the coverage rate, the emission coefficient, and the production. Pricing, therefore, directly increases production costs for industries. To reduce these emissions, it is necessary to reduce production, which can obviously lead to much more serious consequences than substituting between two energy products. The total GHG emissions covered by the pricing are obtained by adding the three types of emissions described in equations 4, 5, and 6. The revenue obtained by the government through carbon pricing is then simply equal to the price of emissions multiplied by the total covered emissions. If the system to be modeled is a tax, the price will be exogenous and the total emissions will be endogenous. On the contrary, if the system to be modeled is a cap-and-trade system, the total emissions will be exogenous and the price will be endogenous. Now that the basic carbon pricing equations are in place, a few additions are needed. Let's start with the concept of carbon leakage first. Carbon pricing imposes additional costs on businesses and households. Households cannot escape these costs. The only way for an individual to completely avoid the carbon price imposed by a country is to move out of the country. More realistically, households will instead choose to change their consumption of fossil fuels. By supporting a higher cost, they will also have to reduce their consumption in general. For service companies, whose production is primarily intended for the domestic market, it is the same. These companies sell their product in the country that imposed a carbon price and if they moved they would lose their customers. They will, therefore, have to adapt to pricing either by modifying their consumption of fossil fuels or by passing part of the carbon cost on to customers. In doing so, they will have to expect a decrease in demand for their products, which will translate into lower production and lower profits. However, this drop in demand will be mitigated by the fact that to offer the same product, competitors usually have to establish themselves in the country and thus bear the same pricing. So companies that are subject to pricing do not have to fear competition from non-tariffed companies. The situation is different, however, for manufacturing companies whose production is usually exposed to international trade. These companies face competitors located all over the world. According to the model of the small open economy, they cannot increase their prices because they change according to the world's supply and demand. For these companies, the increase in costs caused by pricing is equivalent to a direct decrease in competitiveness compared to their competitors in other countries. For a multinational, a factory that makes less profitable profits will simply be closed and production will be relocated elsewhere. Global demand would then be met by foreign competitors who would not have to suffer this cost increase since they are not subject to carbon pricing. In the case of these manufacturing companies, carbon pricing will not have the desired effect. On the contrary, moving production to a less environmentally stringent country could even increase global GHG emissions, causing other environmental problems. This problem is called carbon leakage. In order to avoid carbon leakage, countries that adopt carbon pricing must therefore protect their manufacturing industry. In theory, the ideal way to protect industries at risk of carbon leakage is to impose a carbon tax at borders, for example, to impose a tariff on imported products that are not subject to carbon pricing.
In this way, it is at least possible to protect industries subject to carbon pricing against competition from countries without pricing, at least in the domestic market. For exported products, however, the border tax has no effect since it only applies to imports. It is therefore preferable that the jurisdiction imposing the border tax represents a large market, as its industries will at least be able to benefit from the large size of the domestic market and are less dependent on exports. In fact, a border tax is planned in Europe for 2023, and it is also being studied by the United States. This is good news, as it will be easier for other countries to pass such taxes if these big guys do it first. That being said, in practice, the border tax is difficult to apply. It requires tracking all GHG emissions linked to the production and distribution of an imported product. It is also necessary to properly assess the effect of carbon pricing in each of the trading partners. Knowing that supply chains are complex and that marketing a single product can involve a large number of countries, this is a potentially very difficult task. In addition, the border tax can be seen as a protectionist measure. Implementing such measures around the world will therefore require the participation of large markets and harmonization of rules, possibly under the supervision of the World Trade Organization. Pending international coordination on border taxes, jurisdictions that impose carbon pricing are adopting other more pragmatic and easier to implement solutions, including a partial or complete exemption for large industrial emitters. Indeed, since the main industries exposed to carbon leakage are manufacturing producers, it is possible to target them directly and exempt them from the carbon tax or grant them emission rights free of charge. However, it is important that the exemption or allocation mechanism is not based directly on the level of GHG emissions, as this would have the effect of removing the incentive to reduce emissions. Jurisdictions, therefore, usually set up a performance-based pricing system, whereby the exemption is rather linked to the level of production of the companies. Concretely, the authorities establish a maximum level of GHG emissions per unit of production. This level is different for each industry in order to take into account the characteristics of each of them. A business that meets this emission level is exempt from pricing and may even receive credit if it can do better. Companies that exceed the maximum level must pay the tax or obtain emission rights to cover the additional emissions. In this way, the system reduces the tax burden for businesses while retaining the incentive to reduce GHG emissions brought about by pricing. In return, it reduces revenues for governments and can create a sense of inequity for those who pay the full price on GHGs. In order to model the yield-based system, the easiest way is to assume that the exemption or free allocation is linked to production by a PSI factor. The industry's budget constraint, which corresponds to equation 9, is thus modified to take into account the amount it manages to avoid, which corresponds to the price of emissions multiplied by the amount of emissions exempted. As we just mentioned, this amount of exempt emissions is equal to the output subject to pricing multiplied by the factor PSI. Finally, we can highlight the price of emissions, the coverage rate, and the output, which will multiply the gap between the emission coefficient phi and the exemption factor PSI. Equation 12, therefore, tells us that the more the exemption factor PSI increases, the lower the impact of carbon pricing on a company's income. This equation also shows that a company could reduce its emissions and increase its profits by reducing the emission coefficient phi. In the context of this course, we will assume that this coefficient is exogenous and constant, but it would be possible to make it endogenous by involving technological progress. This would, however, require several assumptions about the relationship between technological progress and the emissions coefficient. Since the combustion emissions of industries are not exempt from pricing, the incentive for companies to reduce their consumption of fossil fuels remains unchanged. The exemption, therefore, has no direct effect on fuel-related emissions, 
and does not change the corresponding equations. For the government, the exemption has the effect of reducing its income. These, as defined by equation 11, are reduced by the amount of the exemption. For example, the price of GHGs multiplied by the amount of emissions exempted. We will now see how governments can use the revenues that come from carbon pricing. In theory, carbon pricing aims to correct an externality, not to increase government revenues. The latter can therefore return the revenue from the pricing to the population, such as the Federal Government of Canada, for example, which returns 90% of the revenue from its carbon tax to households. It could also use these sums to implement policies related to the fight against climate change, like the governments of California and Quebec, which put the revenues of their cap and trade system in a fund dedicated to the issues. On the modeling side, the redistribution of revenue to households will result in lower taxes or levies, or more simply, lump sum transfers. Since households cannot easily reduce their consumption of fossil fuels, this policy choice helps minimize the negative impact of pricing on them and thus reduce the generated inequalities that pricing could generate. Regarding environmental policies, two types of measures can be put in place. The government could choose to subsidize clean energy production. It can be electricity from renewable sources such as hydroelectricity, wind power, or solar power. It can also be biofuels such as ethanol, diesel from renewable sources, or forest biomass. In the model, it will suffice to subsidize these industries if they are well disaggregated. This will have the effect of directly reducing the price of renewable energies and making them even more attractive compared to fossil fuels. The government could also invest in targeted programs that aim to reduce GHG emissions. For example, it could invest in public transportation, offer assistance for investment in energy efficiency, subsidize the purchase of electric vehicles, support research and development in green technologies, put in place regulations or infrastructure allowing a reduction of emissions in sectors not covered by pricing, etc. The modeling of these policies varies according to their nature, and some may be more difficult to represent well. Modeling a redistribution to households can be very straightforward. In fact, the operation may simply be to do nothing. Indeed, if the model is closed by a lump sum transfer, the additional income from carbon pricing will be returned directly to households via this lump sum transfer. Obviously, this solution has certain limitations. First, it is likely that the exact redistribution mechanism is not a lump sum transfer, but rather a transfer based on income or household size. Second, this approach does not ensure that redistribution is equal to revenue from pricing. Indeed, the lump sum transfer that allows the closure of the model takes into account all the changes that have occurred following a shock, not just the carbon income described previously by equation 13. The solution is therefore to create an equation that equalizes the sum spent on carbon revenue. In this way, the use of revenue can be modeled to more accurately represent actual government policy. In this course, you have seen how you can develop a computable general equilibrium model that will answer questions about carbon pricing and, more generally, the fight against climate change. This type of model can certainly help improve society. Indeed, the fight against climate change is one of the major challenges of the 21st century. It is necessary to limit the increase in global temperature, ideally below 1.5 degrees Celsius. With the Paris Agreement, all countries in the world are called upon to contribute to this fight by reducing their GHG emissions. To achieve this goal, carbon pricing is an essential tool. General equilibrium models are very well suited to taking carbon pricing into account. These models represent the production and consumption behaviors of agents according to what economic theory teaches us. Companies maximize their profits, notably by minimizing their costs.
while consumers maximize their utility by optimizing their use of their revenues. They change their consumption choices when prices change, which is exactly the goal of carbon pricing. The fight against climate change is a macroeconomic issue that requires a global and even planetary vision, which corresponds very well to the framework of general equilibrium. Computable general equilibrium models also allow a fairly high level of detail that meets the need to properly model the complexity of pricing. A good computable general equilibrium model must, however, be adapted to the problem it aims to analyze. It will be important to choose the level of aggregation and the production and consumption functions to rely on quality data and to properly model all the components of the system to be studied. These findings apply to all models in this family, but are particularly true in the case of the issue of carbon pricing. In addition, the time dimension of the fight against climate change makes it preferable to study this issue in a dynamic framework. Obviously, all this depends on the resources at your disposal. It is best to have a complete understanding of the system you are looking to model. Expert support can be essential. The quality and level of detail of the data is also an important issue. Accounting for GHG emissions is required for all countries that are signatories to the Paris Agreement, but they do not all have the same means. Finally, the time and resources available to develop the model, including the number of modelers, are not the same for everyone. The level of detail that has been presented in this course can possibly be achieved if the model is under the responsibility of a team, such as in an international institution or within a government. A modeler alone will have to make choices that will allow him to focus on the mechanisms that are of particular interest to him, which is perfectly understandable. Computable general equilibrium models dedicated to the environment and carbon pricing are numerous around the world. It is possible to distinguish them into two main families. On the one hand, global models make it possible to take into account the planetary aspect of the fight against climate change. Since GHG emissions know no borders, it can be very useful to assess this issue in a model that takes into account the planet as a whole. However, carbon pricing varies widely across jurisdictions. These models will therefore have the disadvantage of not necessarily taking into account the specificities of each system. The solution to this problem is the use of national models, which allow better consideration of the characteristics of carbon pricing for a given jurisdiction. Of course, these models will, however, offer a narrower view and make it more difficult to analyze certain issues, such as carbon leakage, for example. Finally, it is possible to link a computable general equilibrium model to another model in order to improve more specific analyses. In general, the linking is made between a top-down model and a bottom-up model. Computable general equilibrium models are top-down models because they offer a more macro and general view of the problem studied. They make it possible to take into account the relationships between all the sectors involved. The disaggregation can be quite fine and still provide a good level of detail. By linking a top-down model to a bottom-up model, the objective is to represent, with a much higher level of precision, certain mechanisms or sectors of interest. Bottom-up models, therefore, usually focus on one sector. Some examples of these are here. Energy models incorporate much more realistic and complex production functions than the CES functions of computable general equilibrium models. They thus make it possible to better represent the use of energy, but also the production processes that emit GHGs. Forest models, as the name suggests, detail the forest sector taking into account land use, forest regeneration capacity, use of wood products, etc. Micro-simulation models are often used in conjunction with computable general equilibrium models. They can be used in the case of carbon pricing models to properly assess the impact of carbon pricing on households, 
especially in terms of the inequalities it can cause. There are also models that deal with the electricity market, both at the level of its production and its distribution, taking into account the challenges of the network, production capacity, etc. Linking the two types of models increases the possibilities of computable general equilibrium models in order to analyze the fight against climate change and carbon pricing. It's up to you to see how you can help push the boundaries even further.